In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Loving and merciful Father, you have sent your song among us to show us and reveal to us our dignity, but more importantly, the glory of your love, the glory of that divine nature which from all eternity has created us to be in relationship with you. You have called us even before we were worthy, and through your love you have made us worthy to be in your presence, to minister to you, to be called among your friends. We pray that we may always trust in your mercy more than our own sin, more than our own brokenness, knowing that in relationship to you, in relationship to your love, you order all things accordingly, bringing life where there was death, bringing eternity. We pray that we might be able to better understand how you are practically calling each of us to grow in holiness, the commitments that we can make in order to better prioritize you in our lives. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the overall theme is holiness is perseverance, right? Not being perfect. And the first night we talked about how love covers a multitude of sins and how all of us have our own issues, our own brokenness, but that doesn't disqualify us from being in relationship with Christ. In fact, it's that relationship that Christ gives us that helps us to have the grace and mercy we need in order to understand how um, our vocation to love can only be fulfilled in Christ. We can't do it alone. We can't do it by ourselves. And so the second night we talked about how Christ draws close to us How he gives us, uh, through his own initiation, he shows forth the way that we are to live with each other, to be present, to not put people in a position where they have to deserve or earn our affections, but that love, the priority of love comes first, and then that is what brings us um, to the type of life that is worth living. And so tonight, I wanted to focus on everyday holiness. What does that mean? And in particular, how do we live this out um, within the messiness of your life, right? When people come to me for spiritual direction, and it's interesting the kind of solutions people automatically think they need to do, and and some of it is right. I mean, we all could spend some more time in prayer. You know, some of us could do uh, good to um, cut out some of the busyness and and, and make sure we're we're having better boundaries here and there and, and try to work on certain virtues, uh, but sometimes people think that, um, sometimes people have some unrealistic expectations, you know, and I'm going to start going to mass every day, I'm going to start doing a holy hour every day, and I'm going to start doing this and that, and actually some people, some people might be called to that, but, but as I'm looking at this lady who's like, you know, who, who has a full-time job, and she's a full-time mother, and, and, and she has a husband, and, and she has all these other responsibilities, I'm just like, I don't... There, there might be some room for these things, and, and, you know, the, but we go through seasons, and the types of spiritual practices we can have, sometimes there might be a season where you can go to Mass more than once a week, and sometimes there's a season where that's not the case, but we should be finding time for individual prayer time. And so one of the things we have to encourage is what holiness looks like for you is going to vary from person to person. And it's also going to vary according to the season in your life. What are your responsibilities? And so we all should have, of course, a prayer life. But what exactly that looks like um, might vary from time to time according to the other responsibilities you have, according to what the Lord is calling you to. And so our relationship with God has to be intentional, right? This is one of the things I've been kind of stressing is that we're not going to accidentally become holy just by coasting in life. Rather, we're going to start drifting down the river because we're dead. Only a living thing can swim against the current. And so holiness is not magic. It involves our cooperation. It requires our engagement. And so we should strive to virtue. And one of the things I've been trying to stress too is that one of the biggest disservices I think we have in the church is that sometimes we adopt this catechetical model of t- telling people about the faith in terms of a proposition or in terms of a bunch of rules. And there's a lot of people that don't understand that everything the church teaches is ultimately ordered towards us having the best relationship possible. 
having healthy relationships. And so we talked about the commandments, how the first three commandments is choose me, respect me, spend time with me. These are the things intrinsic to relationship. And one of the things I used to like to stress to my students when I taught high school is that you don't need the church telling you you should be virtuous. You actually know this if you're being honest. And so one of the exercises I used to always do that was one of my, my favorite ones is I used to say, like, imagine, it's like many of you want to get married, and that's great. Some of you might get married. Some of you might, the Lord might be calling you to serve other ways, right? But think about what is required in order to make a marriage work. Think about what is required in order to have a good marriage. Like, what, what makes you think that you're going to defy the odds and your marriage is going to work when so many marriages fail? What makes you so special? And the reality is, like, you might actually be in that number where you might try the best you can and things don't quite work out because you, cause some people think marriage is magic, right? You say the words and bam, marital life is good. No, no, it's a lot of hard work. And so I said, think to yourself, what are three characteristics that are non-negotiable, that if the person you marry doesn't have these three characteristics, you, the person you're interested in marrying doesn't have these three characteristics, you are not going to marry them. They're, they're non-negotiables. They need to have this, this, and this. What are three characteristics, right? So even in your own mind, think about that. What are, what are the, some type of, you know, maybe personality traits, maybe certain types of virtue that someone you marry would have to have these characteristics, right? So I'd have them, you know, kind of discuss and then kind of write it out and we would talk about it. But let me even say that here. So, so someone, someone contribute. What is, what is a characteristic of someone that, that you, they have to have this characteristic or you wouldn't marry them? Somebody want to volunteer? Someone said honesty? Honesty. They're, going, they're not going to lie to you. They're not going to deceive you. They're not going to try to trick or manipulate you. They're going to be honest. Honesty is really important because how do you have trust if you don't have honesty? And what is a relationship without trust? That's a really, really hard and dysfunctional relationship. And so with honesty, I would also say trustworthiness. Someone you can trust that they're going to be honest. So that's good. Honesty, trustworthiness. What else? Someone who communicates. Without communication, there is no understanding. There isn't. And how many marriages suffer, even well-intentioned people, because there's always going to be disconnect in communication styles and what the person thinks they need to communicate, um, what you think the person should be communicating versus what they're actually saying, right? And so it's, it, it will bode everyone's relationship well to do some formation and good communication, right? Because without communication, there is no understanding. Without understanding, we tend to fill in the blanks, and sometimes we don't give the most charitable interpretation, right? Tell me what's going on. Because, when you're, because even when you are struggling, even when there is a hard decision, even when something is going wrong, if you're communicating, well, now we're in this together. And I'm not going to, and, and as long as we're in this together, even if it's going to get hard, we're in this together. We're on, a, we're on the adventure together versus sometimes there becomes estrangement because one person, maybe even well-meaning, like, I can't tell my spouse because this is really heavy. You know, they try to bear it by themselves. And what they don't realize is that with the lack of communication, your, your love's actually growing colder because the other person is, I don't know why they won't tell me what's going on, right? What else? So commu- good communication, someone who's trustworthy, someone who's honest. Kindness. Someone who isn't mean-spirited, right? I mean, this is right after love is patient, what's the very next thing is said? Love is kind, you know? We, we want to be, we need to be sensitive to the spirituality of, of our partner. And I kind of mentioned this, I think, you know, in terms of the, the insecurities at the heart of masculinity and femininity, right? This is true even as a, as a priest. If all I hear from the parish is all the ways I fail to be the priest they deserve, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, the temptation is going to be there to disengage. I don't need to put up with this. I need, I also need people around me who are going to be kind. Um, Not to say that they're going to ignore my incompetencies, that they're going to find healthy ways to encourage me to be a better priest, 
But also if all they do is rip into me, like that's just, that's just destructive, right? That's the criticizing the baby who can't walk, you know? And then expect them one day they're going to be able to walk well. Kindness, what else? Yeah, do they, do they have a spiritual life, right? And I think this is something that really gives people a lot of tr- trouble, and, and especially in marriage and relationships, is we tend to put, well, let me ask you, you married people, what comes first, your spouse or your child? Some of you delayed, yeah. Um, the easiest way to remember this is you're not married to your child. That's incest. I know we're in Livingston Parish, but... You're not married to your child. You're married to your spouse. And one of the greatest gifts you can give your children is by putting your spouse before them. Because you want them one day to get married to someone that's going to choose them. And so what ends up happening is sometimes couples, very accidentally, they begin oriented their entire life around the schedule of this child. They stop dating. They stop going on date nights. They stop communicating. They stop, you know, spending time with one another. And everything becomes centered around the activities around this child. And the child thinks they're the center of the universe, which can be very unhealthy for the child as well. What kind, of, what kind of relationships are you setting them up for there? And then what ends up happening is the child eventually leaves, and then you have this void and the black hole, and the marriage ends up collapsing. Because it's never meant to be centered around the child. In fact, here's the hierarchy. God first, then your spouse, then your children, and then your extended family, and then, you know, like, there's there circles of priority. And I say this because when we talk about the practicality of a spiritual life, a part of it is, does our calendar reflect our priorities? Is it really God first? Is it really spouse second? Even if that means you have to take your child to one less hobby, one less dance lesson, because you need to make sure you get a weekly date night and do something just with them that makes them a priority and not the child? Do we really, do, does our calendars really reflect that? Because I think that's the, the hard practical decisions in terms of holiness. Because when we say we should love God first, we're not saying you shouldn't love your spouse. And when we say you should love your spouse before your child, we're not saying you shouldn't love your child. But think about this. This is a hierarchy. Your love for your child should be a participation in, and not a substitute for your love for your spouse. Your love for your spouse should be a participation in your love for God and not a substitute. If you substitute your spouse for God, that is idolatry. If you put your spouse above God. And so what ends up happening is practically in the way we live our lives, we tend to invert the triangle. We tend to say kids first, then spouse, and then God. And then the triangle is lopsided and it ends up, ends up crashing. It becomes a, tower, it becomes a false tower of Babel. And then all of a sudden things fall apart. We're like, oh, how did this happen? And all you were doing is you were just trying to do the best you could to love your family and to love your children and provide for them. And then not intentionally, but accidentally, practically in your everyday life, because your child needs this and your spouse needs this and God becomes third and then your your spouse becomes, you know, and then you're accidentally, our priorities end up getting mixed up. You have to be intentional. How do you intentionally put God first? And then your spouse and then your children. Those are some hard decisions. And it's hard to know what that, and that's gonna vary from family to family of what that looks like. But that needs to be the set of priorities you need to be approaching and really having an examination. How are we making sure we're keeping everything in their proper order, their proper hierarchy, right? To make sure that we're not making false idols. All right, so that was good. What else? So we've mentioned... uh, Honesty, trust, communication, kindness. What was the other one? Yeah, relationship with Christ. Like the most important was the one I forget, of course. Uh, But yeah, relationship, do do they have a spiritual life? Do they put God before you? If you want someone that puts, and you think about that. If you're looking for someone and a spouse that puts you before God, then you want to replace God. And, And be honest, how many relationships also fall apart because, because you marry someone who expects you to be like God to them and they, as a replacement to God, and they've made you into a false idol. And that's not good for you, and that's not good for them because guess what? You're not God. You're not going to make them perfectly happy. 
And when you take off that burden, like, hey, I'm marrying this person who's not God and who's not going to make me perfectly happy, but there's a holiness and a commitment. There's a holiness in ordering our lives towards the good of each other and serving each other and loving each other as Christ and revealing that faithfulness that we bring each other to heaven. We bring each other to the Lord, and it takes off the unhealthy expectation that we're going to make each other perfectly happy, which you're not. So relationship with God, what else? These are some good. You see, these are practical things. Yeah, someone who's willing to put in the work. You're willing to be disciplined, right? The heart of every virtue is a certain amount of self-control, which means we have to say no to a bunch of things in order to be free to say yes to love. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in the, the next phase of this. But someone who's willing to put in the work, because you know what? Whether you're working in the house or uh, out of the house, th- th- there's still a lot of work, Right? In order to order the household toward, towards God and to run efficiently, there's a, and in fact, the work you do outside the house is meant to benefit the good of the work being done in the house, which should be ordered first to God and, and then the good of the family. So what else? Someone you find attractive. <laughs> that is important. And, and, and that could be seen in a superficial way if you view attraction merely as a physical beauty, which fades over time. I mean, you are probably as beautiful as you've always been. <laughs> it's our definition of what, you know, but like, um, but so when you find attractive, and I mean, attraction is actually the foundation of all friendship, that we recognize there's something beautiful in this other person that draws us outside of ourselves and we want to be in relationship with that. Right? We tend to think beauty merely in terms of this superficial, shallow, physical way, but beauty really has to do with that person has some virtue, that person has a personality, a sense of humor, or maybe there is something physical that, that, that draws me out. But you know this too, that if, if it's only physical, um, I don't know if you've ever, you know, because think about this. There are times where you can see someone that physically, they're like, that person's beautiful, but then they open their mouth and they're really egotistical and stuff. And then they even begin to, begin to look physically repulsive to you. Because why? Who that is, who that person is, reshapes the way you even see them physically. And you might have another person that initially, they didn't catch your eye physically, but the more you talked to them and the more you saw who they were in terms of their heart, then it even reshaped the way you saw them physically. You know? I like to ask the question, was Mother Teresa a physically attractive person? There's a certain sense that when you see pictures of her, like, she's profoundly beautiful, not in the classical sense of like we wouldn't be putting her on like Vogue magazine or anything, but like the reality of who she is and the beauty of her soul somehow even shines forth in, in, in the physicality of her body. And so that's, that's really a part of having a sacramental view of the human person is that what we begin to see that beauty is more, is in, that even the physical beauty is informed by the spiritual reality. And so physical attraction, substance of attraction is important. Um, yeah, someone who's willing to sacrifice. So when you find attractive, someone who uh, who would be good with children if you want to get married, you know. So when you know um, someone who's going to respect you, someone who is going to find creative ways to show their affection because they want to know you, and they're going to be interested in what you're interested. In. Even if they're not themselves, they're, but they're going to be interested in as much as because this opens ways of how they can show how they love you. So there's, and so we would go over this list in the class, right? We'd come up with a pretty good list. You know, someone that, um, is, that communicates, someone that's kind, you know, someone that's trustworthy, um, someone who's honest, someone who has a good work ethic, they're willing to sacrifice, someone has a spiritual life. We'd, we'd list all these things and we'd, we'd talk about it. And then I would ask them this question. What makes you think that someone like that is going to want to marry someone like you. Because if you want that type of relationship, then you have to become that type of person. These are the virtues. You don't need the church. You don't need me as your teacher. You know, that's what he said. Then I was a teacher. I wasn't a priest yet. You don't need me, you know, wagging my finger and saying you should grow in virtue. Like, you know that. Because your human heart knows that this is a type of relationship. You are made for relationships that are built around respect and trust and sacrifice and kindness and honesty. 
But if you want that type of relationship, you have to strive to become that type of person. You know what God is calling you to. Because this is deep down, the human heart knows. Because we know, it's one of the things uh, Fulton J. Sheen says. He says, we can come to God not only by being good, but through a series of disgust. Sometimes when we encounter and we have those relationships, and maybe even in ourselves, we encounter a certain like, I can't believe I acted that way. I can't believe I said that. And we become disgusted even with our own behavior. And we recognize that we are not acting in a way that's going to bring about the types of relationships that are really going to make us happy, the relationships that we really want. And so we can come to God through a series of disgust being like, okay, I, I don't quite know what I'm made for, but I know that wasn't it. I know when the person treated me that way, I deserve better than that. Because in every frustrated disappointment is an underlying sense that we are created for something very different than that, right? Because God has God is created us for himself, right? This sense of, of perfect love is even within our hearts. So let's, well, let me make, make sure of this. So how are your priorities reflected in your calendar? Because a what without a when is a never. And so this is, if you want to practically go in holiness, a part of that is asking that question. How do I make sure that every day I'm in a conversation with our Lord, spending maybe some time in scripture? And like I said, the time frame, even if it's only like five to 15 minutes a day and you know, sometimes you can build up to more. But like, do we make that a priority? Or do we tend to think, you know what, I'm just going to go through my day. And then at the end of it, if there's some time, then I'm going to pray. And then what do we do when the day gets busy? We, we've met other, every other criteria, but then, we, then we, we tend to, okay, well, prayer that I was too busy to pray today. God understands. You know, that's like our loved one who like lives on their own and they're getting up there in age and we're like, oh, we, they understand I'm busy. They understand I'm busy and we just never, we never talk to them. You know, and our, our religion has to be more than just thinking and talking about God. It has to actually involve being with our Lord, spending time with our Lord. Or else what are we doing? We're treating God like a divine vending machine. Lord, I'm going to turn to you when I'm in trouble. I'm going to turn to you when I want something. I'm going to turn to you when things are easy and I'm more cognizant of, but I'm not going to make an effort, right? And I, even, I mean, sometimes I even hear this, and, you know, and I, I'm not, I'm not um, immune to any of this too. Sometimes you know, I get caught in a bustle and you know, I have to kind of reassert, like, no, no, these are my commitments of prayer because you know, this is about a part of being balanced, uh, but I hear people like, oh, I did so good praying every night before I got to bed. Then I got busy and I stopped. It was, it, it, it was like a part of that is because praying at night wasn't really a part of your calendar. It was just something you did when you had time. And it's, it's so schedule, be intentional. Make a decision that's intentional because if you think you're going to accidentally always have time, you're not. Things are going to get busy. And something's got to give. And so what's the first thing to give? Well, the last thing to give should be our prayer time. Right? But very often it's the first thing. Right? Or else we're treating God like a divine vending machine, right? I put in my prayers, right? And I, want some, I want some power, I want some honor, I want some pleasure, I want some wealth, right? Because Thomas Aquinas says those are the four classical substitutes for God, right? Power, honor, pleasure, and wealth. And we tend to value these things more than the relationship with God. And God gives us these things very often in a relationship, not necessarily when we want as much as we want, but they're not substitutes for God, right? Very often, we value the gift more than the giver, and this is, this is a problem. There's three things in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus says we need to do in order to grow in holiness. And we're going to get really practical, right? Scripture tells us three really practical things that we can do to grow in holiness, does anybody know what they are? What are the three things? Prayer, fast, and almsgiving. Right? We tend to emphasize them during Lent, but in a, in a certain way, they're also emphasized during Advent. 
right? Because Advent, we don't, it doesn't have the same gravity toward, as Lent, but it does have this sense of waiting in the darkness, right? It's preparing ourselves. And so I, mean, I want to make this argument, because we're going to talk about that. What, what is almsgiving, prayer, and, and fasting, and how do they, they actually work together? I think they're intrinsically related, because remember, we want to understand it in terms of the relationship, right? And so when, regarding fasting, Jesus says, when you fast, don't look gloomy, neglecting appearance, look healthy, right? Anoint your head, wash your face, right? And, um, but what is, what is fasting about? So notice he says there's some bad reasons to fast. If we're fasting in order to look like we're fasting, you know what I'm talking about. You know what? I gave something up today. And let me tell you about how hard it was. So you'll think, you'll think I'm really awesome, or you'll think I'm really, or you'll pity me, or you're like, I don't know. Like we, we, could get, we start getting these matches where we, you know, it's, it's good to share our lives with one another, but sometimes it gets kind of showy, or we, we're kind of trying to solicit something, and we're not doing it for the, the best motivation. Right? The same thing with, uh, with prayer. He says, don't, don't pray just to be seen by others. Don't pray like the pagans babbling or using many words. Rather, let it be a conversation. Let it be a relationship. If I'm just praying so I can brag to other people or I can be seen in church like, oh, you know, and I'm, I'm doing it for all these other reasons and not for the relationship, it's not for the most perfect reason. And same with almsgiving. He says, he said, notice in each of these, he's kind of critiquing. There's, there's wrong reasons to do this, right? Don't perform righteous deeds for human praise, right? Blowing the trumpet so as to win the praise of others, right? So even, even almsgiving can be corrupted by our own selfishness. Where we'd be like, look, guess how many people? I guess what I spent my Thanksgiving doing. I went to the soup kitchen to hand out. And I, I actually, I mean, I could be properly motivated. But if the only reason why we're doing this is so we can brag about it or we can think that we're better than other people or superior, it can actually undermine the relationship. And so guess what? If the rules are about the relationship, guess what fasting, prayer, and almsgiving is really about? The relationship. And so when we fast, we don't fast just in order to empty ourselves. We don't empty ourselves in order to empty ourselves. Rather, why do we fast? Well, one reason is, is because we live in a world of convenience. And it's really easy to become addicted to pleasure. It's really easy to become addicted to comfort. It's really easy to become addicted to conveniences. And guess what? If we can't say no to pleasure, if we're enslaved by our addiction to pleasure, right? I have a friend in need. Hey, can you give me a hand? No, no, no. I'm, I'm too comfortable, right? And then we, we can't, we don't, we're not free to respond to the needs of others if we're too comfortable. Why? Because if I go to help you, that's going to be too uncomfortable for me. And so here's the reality. If we can't say no to pleasure, we're not free to say yes to love. If we can't say no to pleasure, we're not for you. So, so why do we fast? Why do we empty ourselves? Not just for the sake of being empty, but in order to make room for relationship. And so think about anything you give up, whether it's a meal that leaves you empty, whether it's giving up. A, and this, so, this, so this, this is my recommendation. Fast from something at least once a week. I know what you're thinking, Father Ryan, if fasting is so important, we should do it once a week. Why doesn't the church tell us we should do it once a week? <laughs> the church does. Every Friday is supposed to be a day in which we remember Jesus' death. We call to mind his sacrifice. And so every Friday throughout the year, now Fridays during Lent, we have to give up meat. It used to be throughout the year, but the yeah, but the, the bishops, our conference of bishops has said, look, you don't have to give up meat fr every Friday throughout the year, but, and this is the but that people tend to ignore, if you don't give up meat, you should be giving up something equally as hard or harder. Did you know that? And so it's not, when, them, when they said, oh, you don't have to give up meat, it wasn't supposed to be a free pass to do nothing. It's supposed to be an invitation of saying, hey, pick your own adventure, <laughs> you know? What, what are you addicted to? 
What is something that you might need to kind of disconnect and show that you're not going to be governed by your desire for entertainment or for food or for whatever? You know, and so I think it is healthy. It is healthy to fast at least once a week from something. You do it on Friday. You should be doing, you should be doing something on Friday. And if you're looking for another day, I also recommend Wednesday. And one of the earliest writings of the early Christian church, the DDK, it talks about how they came together and they fasted on Wednesday and Friday. Right? So the, the, because, and sometimes people say that, like, I'm not getting anything out of prayer. I'm like, well, try fasting in conjunction with prayer. Because guess what? If fasting's about emptying myself, if fasting's about making space, making room in the end, so when Jesus comes, they're not gonna be like, there's no room in the end, pass on. You have to go find a manger somewhere else, right? Fasting's about receptivity. It's about preparing ourselves. Remember, that's prepare the way of the Lord. That was the gospel this weekend. How can we make room if we have not emptied? And so fasting is, is, we're not, like I said, we're not empty for the sake of emptying. We're emptying for making room for our Lord. And so fasting is supposed to be an invitation for God. And whenever I sometimes give the penance for fasting, whenever people come to me for confession, I'll always say this, make this your prayer. Lord, help me rely more on your grace than my own ability to make myself happy. And so then fasting leads us to prayer. Okay, Lord, I made all this room. What should I do? Now offer it up. Offer it up. Here's my cup. I've made room for you. And so then prayer is about being in relationship with our Lord, participating in the sacraments, participating in devotions, spending time making, making God a priority. Lord, here's my cup. I can't fill myself. I'm coming to you empty. And I'm not gonna be filled unless you fill me. And so prayer is about being in that conversation, being in that relationship, making ourselves available so that we can receive what God wants to give us so that we can be that good soil that when he scatters that seed, it's gonna take root in us. And so fasting should lead us to prayer. And that prayer is that relationship with our Lord. Make sure there was anything else I wanna say about prayer before I move on. So it's about that exchange of love. And then... When we've received God's love, when we have been receptive in prayer and he has filled our cup, what are we supposed to do with this love? Am I supposed to just hoard it and put it in a barn? No, I'm pretty sure Jesus was very critical of that mentality. Now I must go love others with the love in which I've been loved. So what does prayer lead us to? Almsgiving. You see the relationship? Now, God has loved me and my poverty and my emptiness indicated by my fasting. Now I must become an imitator of God. And another word for almsgiving is charity, works of charity. And so then when I go and do this corporal and spiritual works of mercy, when I do the work of the church, when I do the work of bearing witness to the gospel, I am feeding people Christ. I'm becoming Eucharist for the world. And so really, that's what almsgiving is about, is almsgiving is about, it's the fruition of prayer. Faith, the relationship and trust of God, and hope, the trust in his promises, comes to fruition in charity, right? Because that's who God is. God is love. And so in prayer, we receive love, and in almsgiving, We become imitators of God's love. We become generous because our Lord is generous to us. We become merciful to others because he is merciful for us. Now even think about that. Are there lots of people out there that do great work for the community? Yes. One of the things that Mother Teresa says is she says the work of the most capable person in the world is vain in God's eyes if it's not connected to love. Because if we're just helping other people, but it's not connected to prayer, it's not connected to relationship, then we're just doing it to glorify ourselves. We just become a secular humanist. And then we might do great work, and that work is valuable, but it's not going to be sanctifying in the same way because it should be connected to love. It should be connected to our Lord. Or you have people that fast, 
but they don't pray, they don't give alms. And I mean, that's, you see that in certain Eastern traditions. They just, they want to reach a state of nothingness, a state of nirvana. They're just emptying for the sake of emptying. No, 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 it's, it's ordered towards relationship. Or if you have people that pray and they're not doing almsgiving and they're not fasting, then, they, then maybe they're just doing it to be kind of a self-righteous Pharisees, right? Who spend a lot of time in prayer, but they didn't lift a finger to help out their neighbor. And so I'm also arguing, not only is there an intrinsic relationship between the three, but when we do one without the other two, there's a corruption there. Does that make sense? There's a corruption there. Because all three are intrinsic to relationship. All three are intrinsic to relationship. All right. And so then there becomes this cycle of holiness, right, in which all of our actions, so emptiness leads us to encounter, encounter leads us to mission, and when we give ourselves a mission, guess what it does? It empties us back again and leads us back to encounter. And so then we always, our work always is meant to be rooted in this relationship, and there's meant to be this cycle of prayer, fasting prayer, and almsgiving. Um, and then just to mention, you know, this is kind of what we talked about yesterday, and this, is, this has to be done in the context of community because we cannot discern nor live our vocation outside of community. Why? Because God is love. God is a communion of persons, and we're also men. So that's, I think that's the other element, fasting, prayer, and almsgiving and the context of a community of love because the Lord entrusts people to us. He entrusts people to help us be accountable, to help us to not be selfish, to help us to become imitators, right? Um, so I want to translate all this into the Mass. I'm going to make an argument that not only is fasting, prayer, and almsgiving intrinsic to the spiritual life of growing in holiness in a very practical way, but it's actually intrinsic to the Mass itself. Did you know that? What's the first thing you do before you go to Mass? You fast. Why? Because you're supposed to show up hungry. You're supposed to show up empty. That's not an accident. Right? The church requires you fast at least an hour before Mass. Show up empty. Right? That's supposed to be a physical sign of your spiritual disposition through which you're entering the liturgy. And I would say go even further than that. There might be some other things you might, might need to be fasting for before Mass in order to really empty yourself. Right? That's a minimum. But there might be some other things that might, you might be more mindful. Like, Lord, if I'm supposed to be showing up with the spiritual disposition of making room for yourself, what can I do? Maybe spending some time in silence before the liturgy or maybe, you know, reading the, the readings ahead of time so you kind of have some familiarity, so you're kind of entering in already ruminating, you know, a, a certain sense of coming to receive. We see this even in the penitential rite. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. What do we do in the penitential rite? We're recognizing all the ways that we have been left empty by the false promises of the world and by our own attempts to make ourselves happy without God. That's what the penitential rite is for. Lord, help me recognize my own emptiness. And so the whole first part of the Mass is this type of fasting, this type of recognition of our own inner poverty that we come to the Lord as beggars, seeking to be in relationship with him. And then what is the Mass? The Mass is fundamentally a prayer, the prayer par excellence of the church. Because Christ gives himself to us in the Mass. He gives himself to us in the community of faith and everybody who comes who's made in the image of Christ and those who are baptized who represents that Christ present to one another. He comes to us in the person of the priest who acts in the person of Christ. He comes to us in the scriptures. He comes to us in the homilies. And most profoundly, he comes to, to us in the Eucharist. If anyone ever asks you why you go to Mass, I think sometimes we, it's not about the rule. Guess what the Mass is really about? The relationship. Did you know that the most fundamental meaning of the Mass is that it's meant to be an exchange of love? Because in every Mass, Christ gives himself to you. It's, it's all throughout the language. of it. Think about the Eucharistic prayer. Take this, all of you, and eat of it. 
For this is my body given up for you, given to you. It's a gift. This is my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant that's been poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. So as often as we eat his flesh and drink his blood, every time we come to the mass and we receive communion, it's an exchange. Right, he gives himself to us in the, in the, the, the scriptures and then we respond internally. And that's, and that's why even after each reading, there's supposed to be a brief period of silence. After the gospel and homily, it's appropriate in certain prayers because we're supposed to be internally responding and giving ourselves back to him. But even think about that. So once upon a time, I kind of went through a phase where I, w- I wasn't having anything to do with the Catholic Church in high school. I went through an anti-Catholic phase. And theologically at the time, I was probably more Southern Baptist than anything else. And uh, going to a lot of different Protestant churches, they have these altar calls. I'm sure many of you know what that is, being in uh, this part of Louisiana. Um, but the emphasis on altar calls is accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, right? And they'll be critical, like, well, we have altar calls. What do you have? Guess what? We have an altar call at every single Mass. First of all, we actually have an altar. Second of all, we have an altar that we And he calls you. Christ reproposes his love to you. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are you that are called to the supper of the Lamb. And that last line actually comes from Revelation. Blessed are you that are called to the wedding feast of the Lamb. It's a marriage proposal. Every mass, the Lord is reproposing his love to you. And just like in marriage, the two become one flesh. Do you notice the wound? One of the ways the Roman centurions would make sure people were dead, the way that they could practice, right? They were making these they didn't break his legs, but instead they poked a spear in his side. The technique would have been to take the the spear and they slipped it through his rib cage and to pierce his heart. Sorry, Miss Adam, I was sorry, 
for the uh, how good a preacher you might be. Yeah, it's sort of fun to hear an amen to that one. <laughs> <laughs> and then, what does the word match mean? So we thank Father Ryan for being here tonight, even though his online viewers, his batteries cut out the last 10 minutes of the mission, and they were cackling and complaining on Facebook. Uh, regardless, uh, we thank Father Ryan for being here tonight, and we appreciate him being here with us to celebrate the liturgy over the past three weeks. It's very edifying as a brother priest uh, to watch him grow in his priesthood and his ministry, and uh, he's always welcome back, right? He's always welcome to come back and, and join us here at St. Margaret. So uh, we've got the rest of the Advent festivities through the year. Watch your Christmas card, and hopefully we will see you around St. Margaret for all those different occasions. Have a good evening. <laughs>